Today it's time to look at some of the most efficient firepower in the entire Guard Army. Hello and welcome back to Auspex Tactics, the strategy and tactics focused 40k channel, where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. We're continuing our look through the Guard Codex today, going unit by unit and datasheet by datasheet, and today's video will be focusing on the Tank Commander and also Knight Commander Pask, the boosted Cadian Tank Commander. We looked at the Lehman Ross Battle Tank last week, and if you haven't seen that video already, I strongly recommend checking it out, as almost all the options are the same. So rather than go over literally everything all over again, I'm just going to focus on what makes these tank commanders different from your standard Lehman Ross. In this video, we'll take a look at their datasheets, any obvious buffs, synergies or combos we can do with them, and how I like to run my tank commanders on the tabletop. In the background, tank commanders are grizzled Lehman Ross veterans, who have been bold or lucky enough to survive long engagements and multiple campaigns in the service of the Imperial Guard. Between them and their crew, they achieve an incredible level of efficiency and coordination, able to be faster, more responsive, and better anticipate battlefield conditions. These tank commanders are placed in charge of Emperor's Fist tank squadrons, and charged with delivering victory via coordinating the entire mechanised advance. Knight Commander Pask himself is a Cadian tank commander, who is famed for single-handedly engaging and eliminating an orc battle fortress, which was pivotal in checking the advance of War Gutcutter. From there his fame has only grown, and he is a seasoned veteran against war machines of all foes, heretic and xenos alike. So let's see what these seasoned veterans can do for us on the tabletop then, with a look at their datasheets. We'll start with a look at the tank commander first. The tank commander is an HQ choice for Codex Imperial Guard, which is quite handy because it means that you can fill out battalions while also adding to your armour saturation. He costs 142 points base meaning that with his default loadout of Battle Cannon and Heavy Bolter, he will set you back 172 points. At base, they have Movement 10, Weapon Skill 6+, Ballistic Skill 3+, Strength 7, Toughness 8, 12 Wounds, 3 Attacks, Leadership 7, and a 3-up save. So essentially your standard Lehman Rush profile, but with one extra pip of Ballistic Skill. This is actually really important for the Imperial Guard Armoury, because getting higher Ballistic Skill can be incredibly helpful when you're fighting anything with negative-to-hit modifiers, as a Ballistic Skill 3 plus unit doesn't mind quite so much about having minus 1 to hit compared with your standard Lehman Ross tanks that only hit on 4s. He can take all of the various options that we discussed in the standard Lehman Ross video. I've already explained why my favourites are the Punisher Cannon, Demolisher Cannon, Executioner Cannon and the standard Battle Cannon. In particular, the Executioner Cannon can be a little bit more viable on the tank commanders as they can tell themselves to reroll ones to hit getting around that problematic overheats rule. I find battle cannons are a fairly decent choice on tank commanders, as it allows them to hang at the back of the field of battle, hopefully being more protected from the enemy's shooting via long range, which is important for tank commanders because they're more points, but the same defensive profile as your standard Rosses, so if you can be hiding them out of the way, then it's a positive. The two shorter range variants, the Demolisher and Punisher, both have very good damage output against their respective targets, but they do involve putting your tank commander a little bit more front and centre, where they might attract a bit more negative attention. But that's the price of having these very powerful guns hitting on threes to be rolling ones. Other than these, you can take sponsons. For tank commanders, I usually think that it is worth upgrading to the plasma cannon sponsons these days, just because they do have their innate order to reroll ones and defend against overcharges. If you have a battle line of three tank commanders, each with a battle cannon and plasma cannon sponsons, then it certainly feels like you have a lot more primary weapons than you actually do. Those plasma cannon sponsons are just as strong as your battle cannon, they just get a few less shots. I think for 10 points each they really are a steal, particularly when you're mounting them on a platform with such good ballistic skill. And even when you're firing at infantry, they aren't much less efficient than the heavy bolter. They do have only an average of 2 shots rather than 3, but they do compensate for that somewhat with better strength and better AP. So you'll often not even lose out that much if you're targeting them at infantry anyway. In terms of the hull mounted weapon, now the last cannon has come down in points a bit, I could really happily go either way. Either keep the tank cheap with the heavy bolter, or upgrade to the last cannon, which does have the advantage of having longer range if your tank commander is sitting back. Finally, you can also take a heavy stubber or hunter killer missile launcher. I'd always take the heavy stubber or storm bolter, usually the heavy stubber myself, as I like that additional range. The hunter killer missile, again, I could go either way on. Obviously, it'll be hitting very accurately with 
ballistics skill 3 up, re-rolling ones. The only downside being that you are loading even more guns onto an already fairly expensive platform. So at some point you are going to be getting to a point where you're putting a lot of eggs in just a few baskets. Again, I'd be happy to either take or leave the Hunter Killer missile. Tank commanders can take things from the vehicle equipment list. Track guards are probably the most useful of the three, but I still don't think they're really worth it if we're trying to optimise as many points as possible. The tank commander has all the same special rules as the standard Lehman Ross battle tanks. They have grinding advance, so if you move 5 inches, you get to fire that main battle cannon or ranged weapon twice. They'll explode as per normal. You have smoke launchers, which are a bit more viable due to one of the tank orders that we'll get onto. And we have emergency plasma vents, meaning that you only suffer one mortal wound per overcharge rather than killing the tank. Now, as for tank orders, these are the other thing that tank commanders get in addition to their extra pip of ballistic skill. Each turn your tank commander can issue one of these three orders, and he can use them on himself or another Lehman Russ within 6 inches. Typically, it is going to be more worth it to issue the order to the tank commander himself, just because with that ballistic skill 3 up, getting any buffs on the better tank is better than ordering around the standard Lehman Ross battle tank that only has a ballistic skill of 4 up, so in general you're going to be getting less bang for your buck from the order. The orders are these. Firstly, you have full throttle, where instead of shooting at all, you get to move in advance again as if it were the movement phase. This one isn't going to be a staple of your tank commanders, but this really can be incredibly handy for late game objective grabs, as presuming your tank commander is still on full health, you'll be moving an average of 27 inches a turn so you can get some absolutely crazy movement out of them if you need to be running for that objective at the end of the game. Next we have the most standard one, which is Gunner's Kill on Sight. You re-roll hit rolls of 1 for the model until the end of the phase. Between this and the 3-up ballistic skill, it works out that you'll be hitting 7 out of every 9 shots that you throw at the enemy, meaning that if you're using this each turn, your tank commanders are basically 55% better shooting platforms than your Lehman Russes, which is really quite a big upgrade. Finally, we have Strike and Shroud, which again is very useful. You issue this if you still have your smoke launchers and you haven't used them. You can shoot, and then you can pop your smoke launchers in the same phase, meaning that you'll be minus one to hits from enemy shooting next turn. If you are expecting your tank commanders to be facing severe return firepower, then this one's actually a really good choice to use in turn one. It can either make your opponent want to shoot something else, which is generally going to be good for you because tank commanders are reasonably fragile for how expensive they are, at least compared with some of our other armour. Or if they do decide that they need the tank commander dead this turn, then they're going to have significantly less efficient firepower in doing so by being minus one to hit. At least for the first turn or two, I would certainly weigh this up against Gunner's kill on sight. It would just be the decision between extra damage turn one, or extra defence in your opponent's turn. So overall, the tank commander is basically a Lehman Russ that's 35 points more expensive, for better ballistic skill, an HQ slot, and those nice tank orders. So let's look at Pask now. Pask is of course a Cadian tank commander, and he'll cost 177 points base, so is a further 35 points extra over a regular tank commander. So in his cheapest format, he's going to be 207 points for a battle cannon and heavy bolter. He gets the same profile as a tank commander, except his leadership 8 rather than 7, and his ballistic skill is a mighty 2 plus rather than 3 plus. There aren't a lot of ways that we can get our guardsmen hitting on twos in the codex, but having it baked into Knight Commander Pask is very nice indeed. Aside from this, his other advantage is being able to issue another tank order. So Pask is actually a tank that you could have order himself, and also order another nearby Lehman Ross to give them re-roll ones to hit, or maybe utilise the Acadian tank order to re-roll the number of shots for their turret weapon. So Pask will have almost double the average firepower of your standard Lehman Russ battle tanks for an additional 70 points, but he does have the same defensive profile. If I was arming Pask, I'd probably want to give him a long range gun, most likely a battle cannon, and pair that with a last cannon and probably plasma sponsons, and have him focus on getting that firepower off while still remaining safe at the back of the board from enemy reprisals. I think Pask's main issue is that in any list that you include him, he is normally going to be absolutely target priority number one for your opponent, as he's no tougher than a regular Lehman Ross, but is significantly more expensive and significantly more dangerous in terms of his firepower. So the challenge with him is really trying to put him in a position where he can leverage that firepower for a few turns without just being wiped out straight away. If you're going for Tank Commander Overload though, you could potentially run three Tank Commanders and Knight Commander Pask, so the enemy has quite a lot of targets to choose from when they're deciding what needs to be killed first.
So let's see what buffs and advantages we can get for our tank commanders. First of all is our choice of regiment. Cadian is a strong one, allowing you to reroll ones naturally when you remain stationary, meaning that you could potentially use Strike and Shroud or the Cadian Unique Tank Order that allows you to reroll number of shots for a turret weapon. This one could be particularly good on a Battle Cannon, Demolisher, or Executioner Plasma Cannon, as you'll get both the benefits of rerolling ones and rerolling number of shots if you stay still. Cadians also get overlapping fields of fire, so for two command points, you could be having all of your tank commanders hitting on twos provided they're all targeting the same targets. Plus, this is the regiment that will allow you access to Pask, so you could have a whole ton of very accurate tank commander fire coming out of the Cadians. Next we have Katajans, which are also an incredibly solid pick for tank commanders. Their brutal strength will allow them to reroll the number of shots for any multi-damage weapons, so this is again amazing on demolishers, battle cannons, and the executioner plasma cannons. In addition, this one will also affect your plasma cannon sponsons should you take them, and is another good reason to take these, so you can achieve a similar effect to the Cadian tank commanders, re-rolling numbers of shots and also re-rolling hit rolls of 1 if you use their tank order gunners kill on sight. You do lose overlapping fields by going Katachan though, so there is a little bit of a trade-off. Vostroen are one of my favourite tank commander choices as well, adding plus 6 inches to the range of all their guns really helps them remain effective while hanging back and staying out of trouble. You'd be surprised just how much this comes up for the plasma cannon sponsons I like so much, and heavy stubbers and heavy bolters. The Vostroans are great for the shorter range weapons, such as the Demolisher Cannon and the Punisher Cannon, as if you have to put them within 24 inches, you really do run the risk of them being reached with a charge via some enemy shenanigans. Being able to hover at 30 inches is a real boon, and I've really enjoyed running Vostroan tank commanders in alliance to Imperial Knights. Their stratagem is also not bad at all for plus one to hit, so you can choose the tank commander that most needs to absolutely demolish its targets and pop that for a cheap one command point to hit on twos re-rolling ones. Finally, Talan are incredibly good for tank commanders as well. Their doctrine will allow you to move and shoot the other heavy weapons that aren't the main battle cannon, as if you were stationary. This is great on the Sponson Heavy Bolters or Plasma Cannons. The Plasma Cannons in particular will love this, as they don't want any extra minus one modifiers to give them greater risk of exploding. In addition, the Talon Tank Order will allow you to move after you've shot in the shooting phase, potentially allowing you to do some shenanigans where you stick your head out of cover, take a shot at the opponent, and then use the Tank Order to retreat behind line of sight blocking terrain, stopping your opponent from engaging the tank commanders with their heavy weapons. This is of course quite board and opponent specific, but it's certainly an incredibly powerful option. Valhallen will allow you to remain closer to your top bracket as you get degraded. It's certainly not a bad bonus, but it only comes into play when your opponent starts damaging the tanks, and sometimes you might never get the advantage of it if they just wipe out a full tank and don't damage the others. Armageddon will give you the ability to ignore minus one modifiers for AP, with incoming weapons, so it might be a bit handy on things like auto cannons. but to be honest, most of the things that are efficient at taking out Lehman Rosses have an AP better than minus one in the first place, so it's not going to be the most useful. And finally, Mordians get their 5 plus Overwatch, which is particularly powerful on tank commanders when combined with defensive gunners, but in all honesty, if you're getting your tank commanders charged, then something's already gone very badly wrong. These guys need to be screened, and not facing the brunt of the enemy charge. As characters, Tank commanders can take warlord traits and relics, although it could be fun to make a tank commander your warlord, I would generally advise against it, mainly because they're already high priority targets for your opponent to eliminate, and by making one of them your warlord, you'll likely just be handing slay the warlords to your opponent, as unlike infantry characters, they can't hide out of targeting options behind other units. That being said, old Rogers could be a really powerful option to get some flat rerolls to wound next to a bunch of other tank commanders, I just typically want to put this on an accompanying infantry character such as a platoon commander who's hanging out next to the tank commanders you have rather than actually putting it on a tank commander where that tank can just get shot. If for some reason you make Pask your warlord and really double down on motivating your opponent to kill Pask then his warlord trait is superior tactical training, the Cadian one, which when he issues an order on a 4-up will allow him to issue an additional order to another similar unit within 6 inches. On average, this should mean that he could order two tanks as well as himself, which isn't a bad bonus at all, but like I said, he's already an incredibly high priority target for your opponent to target, so it's probably not worth it compared with keeping your warlord alive. 
In terms of other character support, Guard Psychers can be really helpful to pair with Tank Commanders, a pair of Astropaths with the Psychic Barrier and Night Shroud power to give plus 1 to saves and minus 1 to hits. It's a really solid combo with Tank Commanders, and particularly with Pask as he's such a high priority target. With this little combo up, hopefully most of the turns, at least one of your Tank Commanders is going to be significantly harder to remove. With how cheap Astropaths are, I would usually include these guys in most lists to be honest. It's generally worth only a 30 point investment. You can also have a Tech Priest wandering around to help repair your tanks. For me personally though, he sort of struggles to justify his points cost even when he is repairing very important units such as Tank Commanders. I'd say he's a nice to have around, and if he does manage to live and repair things for several turns in the game, he's probably justified his existence. Plus can be another annoying little character to put on objectives, but I certainly don't think he's a mandatory pick or anything you should stress over having. Lehman Russes of course have their own Vigilus formation, the Emperor's Fist Tank Company. This one's found in the Vigilus Defiant book, and it costs 1 CP to access. It gives you a Warlord trait that will allow you to re-roll hits in Overwatch for your Warlord and any nearby Lehman Russes, which you could pick up for 1 command point with the field commander stratagem. This one isn't bad really, and it could genuinely help you out in a pinch, particularly if combined with defensive gunners, so it is certainly an option for spending a 1 command point on. They also have a stratagem called Steel Phalanx, where if you charge your Lehman Rust battle tank into an enemy unit, on a 4+, plus, it receives D3 mortal wounds in addition to normal damage. Typically charging your Rosses is usually a pretty awful idea, but if you absolutely needed to take an objective and maybe kill one last enemy character that had one wound left or something, I wouldn't write this one off entirely. Sometimes it could actually be pretty devastating. In reality though, there's two reasons that I would usually use this Emperor's Fist tank company for tank commanders. The main one being their Heirloom of Conquest, the Hammer of Sundrance. Hammer of Sundrance is basically a relic battle cannon that gives you a flat 3 damage rather than a d3 damage. Essentially against hard targets, that's a 50% damage increase, which is just amazing when tank commanders are some of the most efficient units in the guard codex to begin with. I would strongly think about this one every single time that I was thinking about using tank commanders in an Imperial Guard list. When this thing rolls well, it can really devastate huge enemy threats in a single turn, particularly when you combine it with other stratagems, such as the Vostroim plus one to hit, or Cadian overlapping fields. Finally, this Vigilus formation also gives you a one command point stratagem called Unyielding Advance. This one will let you move your Lehman Rust battle tank up to 10 inches and still double fire the turret weapon. This one actually comes up a surprising amount in my games, because often you'll be just a little bit out of being able to double fire your tank commander's main battle cannon at a key target while remaining in grinding advance, or sometimes it could allow you to get a cheeky line of sight that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. When I'm running tank commanders, I'll often find myself using this, perhaps once per game. So overall, if you are running a lot of tank commanders and Lehman Rosses in general, I would generally recommend this formation for the Hammer of Sundrance alone, but the other options certainly aren't useless. In terms of base codex stratagems now, we have Crush Them to hit on twos in close combat, usually best when it's going to make the difference whether or not your tank will be locked up next turn. Jury Rigging, plus one wound, usually best if you're going to go from one bracket to a higher bracket and get a ballistic skill benefit out of it. Officio Perfectus Command Tank to make your tank a leadership 9 aura for 2 command points. Maybe best on something that's going to be a bit happier following infantry around rather than an expensive tank commander. Inspired Tactics can actually be useful on tank commanders, allowing them to issue an additional order, which sometimes could be very powerful to also allow you to order around a Lehman Ross next to them, as they'll usually be wanting to use their first order on their own tank. Defensive Gunners can give you 5 plus Overwatch, this one's a staple one and is a very good benefit to deter charges from enemy units, or at least take a chunk out of them when they do charge. Vengeance for Cadia should probably be used once a turn when you're fighting Chaos. Tank commanders are some of the best targets for this in my Knights and Guard list. Whenever I was fighting Chaos, I'd try and decide whether I wanted my Punisher or my Hammer of Sundrance battle cannon tank to be using this one each turn, as 40 rolls to wounds absolutely skyrockets the amount of damage the tanks do, which as we've discussed is already great. For example, if you use Hammer of Sundrance combined with Vengeance for Cadia, you do an average of 11 wounds to any Toughness 7 vehicle, never mind all of the tank's secondary weapons which you can fire at other targets. So how would I use tank commanders in-game then? When you're setting them up, 
You mainly need to think about screening them out, getting them good lines of fire, and if necessary, trying to keep them safe from the brunt of enemy firepower. Tank commanders are not going to want to be on the front line. Even if you have the Demolisher or Punisher variants, then you're going to be wanting to throw some infantry squads up in front of them, because the minutes that they get charged and tagged in close combat, they're going to be useless for that turn, and potentially if your opponent just repeatedly does that trick, you could have just lost their firepower for the rest of the game. So basically you're going to be wanting a decent amount of infantry squads to stop enemy units trotting straight up to them, and certainly stopping any deep strikers from coming in nearby. If you're going second, I'd certainly consider using prepared positions to give them two up armor saves, and if possible, if they can lurk out of line of sight, then that'll keep them safe even better. If you have a lot of tank commanders, then you want to prioritize keeping the ones with the Hammer of Sundrance and Knight Commander Pask if you have him, as safe as possible. If you have the choice of which tank commanders your opponent can shoot, then make it ones that aren't these. Even if they have to move and shoot turn one, it's better than them just being shot off the board, for absolutely no gain. I've already alluded to my favourite loadouts for tank commanders, but general my all-round take all comers build is battle cannon, plasma cannon sponsons and heavy stubber, and I'm equally happy with either the heavy bolter or last cannon, and to take or leave the hunter killer missile. These guys can happily sit fairly far back in the deployment zone, keep well screened, and hopefully dominate the long range firepower war. With demolishers or punishers, I'd really want to be running them as Vostroyan myself. That extra 6 inch range just gives you so much more tactical flexibility, and I do think that it is worth giving up the increased damage output that you'd get from being Cadian or Kastachan. These are certainly a very scary variant. Demolisher tank commanders, though being relatively short ranged, now have, I believe, the single best points for damage on vehicles efficiency out of the Guard Codex. If you have one with B-roll 1s and hitting on 3s, you'll typically be getting off 10 or 11 wounds on a toughness 7 or 8 vehicle without an invul save. Very, very scary indeed. Tank commanders are one of the units that I'd make liberal use of stratagems on throughout the game, particularly things like that Vostro and plus 1 to hit, overlapping fields of fire from Cadians, certainly Vengeance for Cadia, and anything else regiment specific that you can use to buff their damage output as all of these are going to have really decent returns on such a high efficiency model with a ton of guns. The main weakness of tank commanders is that compared with a lot of our guard armour options, they're actually reasonably easy to take out, points for points. They're really going to go down quite easily indeed, when you start focusing last cannons on them, compared with some other targets, particularly those that have invor saves like Imperial Knights. I believe that positioning is really quite a key part in trying your best to alleviate this, putting your least important tanks further forward so your enemy is more inclined to shoot them with more weapons in range, and keeping the more valuable tanks back, maybe in cover, maybe out of line of sight of some things, to try and make every choice as bad a choice as possible for your opponent. And you can further compound that by using the Astropaths with Psychic Barrier and Night Shroud to make one or two of your tanks even more durable that turn. Overall, I certainly think that tank commanders compete decently in the Imperial Guard army list, they're a lot more efficient in terms of firepower and damage output compared with the standard Lehman Ross, though naturally they are considerably less durable. Point for point, because they have a higher points cost for the same durability. For that reason I tend to recommend running either three tank commanders or none for the most part, just because if you do have one of the tank commanders there amid a whole bunch of other Lehman Rosses, then you know that that's the one that your opponent is going to focus on first and you might not get any additional bonus from that one tank commander if he gets shot down turn 1 in flames. Overall though, I do think that they're one of our most competitive units, and it's very easy to see why they're so prevalent in today's meta. I think we'll continue to see them going forward, and I suspect we'll see a lot more demolisher cannons about with the update to their rules. So thanks very much for listening to another Auspex Tactics video. Please leave your thoughts on the use of these mechanical beasts down in the comments below. We will be continuing our Imperial Guard tactics series every couple of days from now on. Hopefully we're going to look at some orders in the next episode and debate about when best to use them. So stay tuned and subscribe if you'd like to see that. I do also have a Patreon page if you'd like to show any support to the channel. The link is down in the description below. And of course a big thank you to my current Patreons who helped make this channel possible. Thanks very much for listening and I'll hope to see you guys next time.